Well, let's take our course books and turn to page number six. This is going to be courses number 10 and 11 to begin our time of worship. We'll sing the first one, Jesus Christ is all I need, and then under the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ is made to be all I need, all I need. He alone is all my plea, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. Jesus is my all in all, all I need, all I need. While He keeps, I cannot fall, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption, full and sure, He is all I need. He redeemed me when He died, all I need, all I need. I with him was crucified, he is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, he is all I need. He's the treasure of my soul, all I need, all I need. He hath cleansed and made me whole, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption, full and sure, He is all I need. Glory, glory to the Lamb, all I need, all I need. By His Spirit sealed I am, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption, full and sure, He is all I need. And if He's been revealed in us, we say He's all I need, He's all I want. Number 11, under the blood of Jesus, we'll sing this twice. Under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, safe while the ages roll. Safe though the worlds may crumble. Safe though the stars grow dim, under the blood of Jesus, I am secure in Him. One more time. Under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, safe while the ages roll. Safe though the worlds may crumble, safe though the stars grow dim. 
under the blood of Jesus, I am secure in Him. Amen. All right, David's coming to read for us. Psalm 129. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth. May Israel now say, Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The fire has plowed upon my back. They have made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous. He hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. Let them all be confounded and turn back that hate sign. Let them be as the grass upon the housetops, which withereth before it groweth up. Wherewith the mower filleth not his hand, nor he that bindeth sheaves his bosom. Neither do they which go by say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Father, you are righteous and gracious and thankfully merciful to your people. Though many afflict your chosen, none can prevail against your will. Thank you for Christ and his finished work. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, well, let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we'll sing this hymn to the tune of There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. As on the cross of Christ I thought, it seemed I heard one. Is all this nothing in your eyes? You do this day pass by. It is not such suffering greater than that which you've seen before. And was there ever any man? Who grieved and suffered more? I looked again and what I saw, I cannot fully tell. It seemed within his very bones there raged the fire of hell. What caused you grief, I ask the man, what crimes could you have done? That God, Jehovah, struck you down and left you all alone. His answer cut my heart like steel. And left me void of breath. Tis for your sins this pain I feel. For you I go to death. Your soul before my father's throne could find no place to this is the way God can be just, and you be justified. Jehovah's mercies never fail, each morning they are due. Great is his faithfulness and love. Therefore, we're not consumed. Jehovah God in Christ the Son shall all my portion be. My soul shall bear your wing for him and live eternally. I don't know the original author of those words, but certainly we can identify as the Lord's people in the testimony. The Lord was pleased to open our eyes to see Christ 
and his death it was for such as we are that he paid that debt robert's coming to read for us now good morning matthew 13 the reading of the lord's word the same day went jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places, for they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear? Let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever it has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of the saith, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. That said, any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parables of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives <clears throat> by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet has he not root in himself, but dirt for a while. For when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh <coughs> unfruitful. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground, is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and saith unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow seed in thy field? From whence then has it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, that's why ye gather up the tares, the root up, also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, 
but gather the wheat into my barn. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, so the whole was leavened. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parables of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it shall be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man has found, he hideth, and for joy thereof will go it and sell all that he has, and buy that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they threw to shore, and sat down, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth, and sever the wicked from the, among the just, shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed hence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence had this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then had this man all these things? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So let's pray. Father God, we come to you now. We do thank you for this word. Your word is precious. Lord, we ask you that give us the grace to bow to your sovereign Christ. Our Lord is our peace. He is our Israel. Lord, we, we ask you to give us spiritual ears and spiritual eyes to hear and see in the message today of Christ and only him. Be with Brother Kenny and deliver us the word today. In Christ's name I pray. You can spend a lifetime studying Matthew 13. What a great portion of scripture. Grateful for the reading. Let's take our hymn books. We're going to stand and sing this before the message. Hymn number 145. 145. Hail. Thou once despised Jesus. Hail thou once despised Jesus. Hail thou Galilean King. 
Thou didst suffer to release us. Thou didst great salvation bring. Hail, thou agonizing Savior, bearer of our sin and shame. By thy merits we find favor. Life is given through thy name. Paschal Lamb by God appointed, all our sins on thee were laid. By Almighty love anointed, thou hast full redemption made. All thy people are forgiven through the virtue of thy blood. Open is the gate of heaven, peace is made twixt man and God. Jesus hail enthroned in glory, there forever to abide. All the heavenly hosts adore thee, seated at thy Father's side. Therefore, sinners, thou art pleading, there thou dost our place prepare. Ever for us interceding, till in glory we appear. Worship, honor, power, and blessing, thou art worthy to receive. Loudest praises without ceasing, be it is for us to give. Help ye bright angelic spirits, bring your sweetest hopeless lays. Help to sing our Savior's merits, help to chant Emmanuel's praise. Thank you, you may be seated. If you will look with me in your Bibles to John chapter 7, which is going to be my text for this message. The title of this message is Seeking But Not Finding. Most people think today that, well, you just seek the Lord and find it. Here we find the words of our Lord Himself. And uh, question is, why is it that many say they're seeking the Lord? Here, if we go up to verse 30, although my text is from verse 32 down to verse 36, it says here in verse 30, then they sought to take him. There is a Jesus that's being preached today that is popular, and yes, many do seek that Jesus. He's a figment of men's imagination. They get in their minds an idea, just like these Jews had an idea of who they thought the Messiah should be and how he would act when he came. But when they compared that image, and that's what idolatry is, idolatry is an idea. When they compared that idea of who the Messiah should be with this one, Jesus of Nazareth, they didn't seek him to embrace him. Just like we find many today, when you declare Christ in all his glory and sovereignty as the judge of all men, giving eternal life unto as many as the Father has given him, but then condemning whom he will, people react, oh no, that's not the Jesus that we seek. Here they sought to take him, but it says, no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Here's where Peter declared on the day of Pentecost that this one, according to determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, delivered up into wicked hands. But it was going to be in God's time, in that hour, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that he purposed to save. And here in verse 31, although there were these that sought to kill him at that time, many of the people believed on him. 
God always has a remnant. Those that he has reserved to himself. And those are the ones that he causes to believe on him. And so they ask this question, if this is not the Christ, because they had the scriptures, they were read in the synagogues. They said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Who could ever do anything more than what we find here? And according to the scriptures, when the Messiah would come, it would be with signs and miracles that he would do. And so that's a good question they ask. Is there any that could teach with more authority than this one? Is there any here that could redeem any more than what this one has done to redeem. Now here's where we pick up the text now for this message, seeking but not finding. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. That word murmured there actually means whispered. The people, as the Lord was drawing their heart to Christ, they began to whisper. He said, why were they whispering? Well, because these Pharisees were wanting to impose themselves and kind of taking a head count to see, well, who's going to follow him or not? And put pressure upon them. So the Pharisees, when they heard that the people murmured or whispered such things concerning him, it says, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. If they couldn't get the people to take him, then they themselves would do so. Such was the enmity, such was the hatred of these self-righteous leaders toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where our Lord says in verse 33, then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while am I with you. It shows us right here that Christ, in coming to this earth, his coming to be that sin bearer was but for a little while. And he's suffering that he would be subjected to, according to God's purpose, would be just for a little while. It wasn't according to man's whim. And so he says, yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. That was the point already of their contention, that he said that he came from heaven, that he came from the Father, and he and the Father were one. They were looking on a man. And even as we read there in Matthew chapter 13, even those in that area where he grew up marveled at his wisdom and said, is this not Joseph's son, the carpenter? We know his brothers and sisters. That shows right there that Mary had other children after she had given birth to Christ. She was a virgin when that he was conceived in her womb, but she had other children, and they marveled that he would be of that particular family and yet have such wisdom. Well, they marveled because they didn't know him to be as God in the flesh in whom is all or all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now here's the title of the message. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. There's some that are appalled at that. They think it's their right. Well, if I seek Christ, I should find him. Nope. It's not according to your whim or fancy as to who it is that he grants. We're talking about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Imagine somebody saying, I'm going to enter into the presence of the king and I'll do it when I want to. No, you won't. Back in the old day, a king was a king. They'd lop off your head. You shall seek me and shall not find me. So here right there, we see that the Lord himself purposed that not all that sought him would find him. He thanked his father that the father had given him authority over all flesh in John 17 to give eternal life unto as many as the father 
had given him. And he says, where I am, thither ye cannot come. You can see now, <laughs> this is what I love about our Lord's teachings. Even as we read in Matthew 13, he spoke in parables. And he explained that, as Brother Robert read, that those that are without might not see and might not hear. I guarantee you, this is not the Jesus that's being preached today in most congregations. He's a Jesus that is at man's beck and call. And if you'll just call on him, he's always there for you. He's there with open arms. He's, he's willing and he's waiting, but it's up to you. That's not what our Lord said here. You'll seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither he cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go? See, this is not a kind of teaching that natural-minded men, even the most educated in religious studies, know the answer. And even now, there are many that, when you read commentaries on this particular portion, they have go back and forth about his meaning. But I love the simple, plain word of the Lord. That's set forth here. Whither will he go that we shall not find him? People say that. Well, what kind of Jesus is that? that some can seek him and not find him. In their minds, naturally, they're thinking, well, if he's rejected here, will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? You study a little bit about Jewish history. There were many Jews, even at this time, that were still dispersed throughout the lands. Began back there with the Babylonian Empire. Some 500 years before Christ came into the world. And after the Babylonian Empire, there's the Medes and the Persians. We've been studying this in the book of Daniel on Wednesday nights. And after the Medes and the Persians, then Alexander the Great, the Greeks. In fact, the influence was such that even our New Testament is written originally in the Greek language. And during that time, many were dispersed. God purposed every one of these. And then ultimately, the Romans, the Roman government, came to power. Many fled Israel and went into other lands. And so these Jews are thinking that when he says, whither I go, you'll not find me, that he was speaking of going and hiding himself in the, among the, what they call the diaspora, the dispersed people. Well, prophetically, we know that ultimately God purposed that Christ should go to those Gentile nations through the preaching of the gospel. That's what he said to remain in Jerusalem after he ascended on high. And that when the Spirit would be poured out, it would begin in Jerusalem and then in Samaria and then the uttermost parts of the world. So here they are puzzled again by the words of our Lord, as most people are unless they're taught of the Spirit. And they said in verse 36, what manner of saying is this? Now you can see in our translation, manner of is an italic, so it wasn't literally in the, the original text. You could read it, what saying is this? There are times when you read about our Lord's teaching where they said this is a hard saying. That's the sense here. What saying is this that he said, ye shall seek me and shall not find me. See, that's an offense to man. That's an offense to man's intellect. That's an offense to man's determination or self-determination. We hear a lot of preaching today about man's supposed free will. That's all up to man. No. But you can see how they were already offended by such a doctrine, by such a teaching. What kind of saying is this? What hard saying is this? That's how they were finding it. 
that he should say, ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither he cannot come. Do you notice something about this particular question? The Lord never answered it. There are many questions that remain unanswered, especially when they're not asked, because the Spirit of God is causing a sinner to cry out unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust that I'm speaking to some here that have sought the Lord. But I tell you, if you have, you've sought him based upon the spirit of grace, taking your heart and drawing your heart to him. And if any of us can say we know the Lord and that we found him, our testimony is rather going to be, no, we were found of the Lord. Else we would be just like anybody else. That's what James wrote about in James chapter 4. Because we live in a generation of people who supposedly are seeking the Lord. Last time I saw the survey come out, they say that 80%, it's gone down some, but 80% of the population in the United States considers itself to be Christian. Well, we know from what Christ said that not all those that say, Lord, Lord, are going to enter into his kingdom. Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many mighty works in your name? And what will the Lord say unto them in that day? I never knew. Here in James chapter 4, this is addressed to some that... There were warrings and fightings among them. I liken this even to these religious Jews of the day. Each one had their school of teaching and theology and doctrine. And there was constant bickering and bantering back and forth. Here James says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? This is not talking about physical wars. It's talking about spiritual Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? This is religious warfare. I'll tell you, there's not any scripture or writing that's more debated and argued than what we hold in our hands right now. You say, why? Why are there so many different denominations and divisions? Well, each one has their own thought or idea about what this word means. And that's where we get in trouble. He says, you lust and have not. That word lust is a strong word which means to seek something that you absolutely desire. What is it that men seek today? They want to escape hell. That's the number one thing. If they could just live their lives however they want and still somehow not end up in hell, and they're going to do whatever it takes. And there's plenty of religious leaders willing to tell them what to do. Some even get down on their knees and walk on broken glass, on bare knees, thinking that somehow they're going to enter into the kingdom in that way. You kill. Do you realize that there have been more deaths throughout history based upon false religion? And uh, some that even holding the Bible in their hand go in and rape and pillage and have done so down through history. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not, because you ask not. So there you say, well, you ask not. But here it goes on and says, you ask. So you have to understand verse 2 in a sense, the problem is you ask not a right. You ask not according to the Spirit of God. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. I don't know about you, but this is a serious warning here. It's not just a matter of like this popular message says, well, just seek Jesus. Jesus is the answer. My th thing I always say when I see that, well, what's the question? What, what is it that you seek? And how is it that you seek? 
Well, the first thing I would say here, coming back to my text in John chapter 7, is that without the Spirit of God, giving that right spirit, that seeking, there's going to be nothing but ignorance and confusion and puzzling. That's what we see here about these religious leaders. These were the doctors and the teachers of the day. And they loved to flaunt those titles. And yes, they had the scriptures. They were the keepers of the scriptures. It's not like today where we have this Bible in our hand and you can pick one up just about anywhere. It's still the number one sold book in the world. They lived in a day where if anybody was going to hear the scriptures read, they had to go to these synagogues. And that's where these copies were. And that's where these scribes were. Think about how the Lord has preserved his word down through the years to where we have the privilege of reading these scriptures. How did he preserve it? He preserved it by men who did not even believe in the Christ of the scriptures, and yet God sovereignly worked through them so that when they made copies, and they're still finding portions of scripture, most recently they dug up some more from the minor prophets, what they call the minor prophets, and some portions that have these scriptures, and when they've gone back to compare with what we have today, it's exactly what we have. God is so purposed. So they had all of this, and yet were blind and did not see Christ. In fact, opposed Christ. I find the same today. And I would be of that number were it not that it pleased God to reveal Christ to me. I was raised under this scripture. I was taught from my youth up. Went to schools of learning to the highest degree and came out and did not know Christ. And this was in institutions where they believed the Bible to be the word of God. We learned a lot about, about culture. We learned, learned a lot about history. And uh, we went through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, studying every aspect of the book. You say, well, what was missing? Christ. It wasn't until I was already in Africa and been preaching out there for seven years and got up one morning to read the scriptures with a kerosene lamp. We didn't have electricity at the time. Sat at that desk, it was hot, no air conditioning. And the Lord directed my heart and mind, Isaiah chapter six, in the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, I lifted up. And it was as if, as if the Lord at that point and did laid me low. I cried with Isaiah, woe is me. And there was such a, a understanding or depth of my own lost estate at that time for three and a half months. I couldn't see any light. And then as the Lord began to be merciful and open my eyes to scripture, I, I went back and read the Bible five times through. Beginning to end, beginning to end, wondering how it is I could have missed Christ. How it is I couldn't have seen him. And so when I read this about the Pharisees and how it was they responded and reacted to the Lord Jesus Christ, I have to take my place with them. A lot of times people read the scriptures and say, well, I don't understand how the Pharisees would do that. Well, then you don't understand your own self. They sought him, but not to welcome him, but to kill him. And I dare say this Christ that is the Christ of Scripture. Many today, I've heard people sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And they can sing at the top of their voices until you begin to declare unto them, Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? How is he the Son of God, the eternal Son of God? How is it that God has purposed to save a people that God has chosen? This isn't just up to anybody. He didn't come down here to offer himself. He came to give his life as a ransom to his father to earn and establish that righteousness necessary that God might be just to justify. And here's the thing that gets people mad. When you tell them that 
He didn't die for everybody. Somebody started a lie years ago and said that he laid down his life for every single sinner in the world. Well, I'll tell you this. If he did, and people end up in hell anyway, you have not got a Savior. There are no persons in hell today for whom Christ died. If you believe that, you don't know Christ. He came to give his life to satisfy God the Father that God might be just to justify, declare righteous. See, when people get upset at me for preaching what the scriptures clearly set forth, I ask them the question. When you say that Christ died for every single person, what do you put in die for? You mean he redeemed everybody? You mean that he reconciled everybody? Because that's what died for means. That's what substitution is. Took the place in death for everybody. If you believe that, and yet everybody's not saved, then you don't have a savior at all. This is why people get upset. See, they'll they'll want to kill that kind of Jesus. And I've had people get in my face over that. But I'll tell you, this is the Christ of Scripture. And unless the Spirit of God is pleased to teach us of who this Christ is, we'll never know. We'll seek a Jesus, but we'll never find this one. So the second thing I would say here is that all can read and hear, but not all do hear. See, these Pharisees, they had the scriptures. In fact, they stood up in their synagogues and read these scriptures and commented on them. And there were many times even when our Lord Jesus would go and sit in their midst. And when they'd hand him the scroll to read, he would read. Yet they did not perceive that this was that one of whom those scriptures spoke. In fact, if you look over in Luke chapter 4, again, just explaining how it is here that the Lord is drawn a line. It wasn't that they didn't have the word. And it wasn't that they didn't have physical eyes to read it. It wasn't that they didn't have physical ears to hear it. But left to themselves, they did not perceive. They could not. They, they sought a Messiah. They were seeking a Messiah. But they could not find him because they weren't seeking this one because of the blindness of their heart. And in Luke chapter four, we have this example here where Christ was in Galilee, there in verse 14. And there went a fame of him throughout all that region round about. That's where he was raised up as a child. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Back then they didn't have chapter divisions. It was just opening the scroll and finding that place. The Lord purposed that in time, editors take and put chapter divisions in our scriptures and, and verses to make it easy to read and to find our place for the public reading. But here he found the place and where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He was reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Now there's some that when they take that scripture, they say, well, everybody's poor. And so he came for everybody. Everybody's brokenhearted. Everybody's captive. Everybody's blind. So this is for everybody. I'll read on. He closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them 
that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Can you imagine our Lord reading this portion of scripture? I would love to hear it. And he began to say unto them, here it is, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He's that one of whom Isaiah spoke, the anointed of the Lord. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. There again, he's saying that you're going to want to see some things done. But it's not going to be according to your whim and fancy. He said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. What is there about this Christ? The gracious words, they started off saying, Oh, how gracious are those words. I'll tell you, if you just want to preach generally about a Jesus from Scripture, you can take a lot of verses and preach him in a manner that no one gets upset. No one gets offended. Talked to a preacher one time that told me, he said, you know, I, I see what you're saying about Christ and Scripture and the distinctness of his message, but I can never preach that in my congregation. I said, well, why wouldn't you? He said, well, they'd run me out. Well, better to be run out. Our Lord didn't leave open-ended statements. When he saw these people and their response and reaction, he says to them in verse 25, and this is the offense. And this was the offense over here in John chapter 7, when many believed on him, that is, those that Christ himself was drawing, but the others sought to kill him. What was it? He said, I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias or Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. That wasn't even in Israel. That was outside of Israel. That's up in what we know as Lebanon today, between Tyre and Sidon. And as if that wasn't enough an offense to these, because the Lord knows their hearts, he didn't back off and think, well, I better not cause a disruption here. No. He said, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, that would be Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed. Well, who does the cleansing? That's God that does it. God gave no cleansing to any of them save Naaman the Syrian. Oh, you could not have said a bigger swear word than that to these that were in this synagogue. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. I'll tell you what, if you want to find out what kind of Jesus people know and believe in, just preach him as he is here in Scripture. and Don't hold back. Sovereign Lord saves whom he will, saves everyone that he came to save. And when you see people get upset, start gritting their teeth. Why is it? Well, they found a Jesus, but it's not the Christ of Scripture. They will not have this one to reign over them. Who reigns but a sovereign Lord? And here they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him under the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, and they might that they might cast him down headlong. And he passing through their midst of them went his way. That shows he's sovereign. They weren't going to put him to death one second before what God purpose should be done. You realize ultimately when those priests did offer up the Lamb of God, they were doing it according to the law. They just didn't know it. It was on the Passover, exactly in fulfillment of what the Old Testament said. He was the Lamb without blemish, without spot. He was delivered into their hands, their wicked hands. They were offering up the Lamb of God. They were doing their will, but in so doing, they were accomplishing exactly what God himself had willed. And so we see here, even though they could read, even though they had the scriptures and heard them read, yet they did not see. 
and they did not hear because that's not man's prerogative. And I say the same thing today. I can preach this message to a mixed congregation and some will get up and go out and think, oh, what a blessing. And others are going to get up and go out, I'll never be back. I'll never go back. I'll not have that Jesus. Well, why is it some believe and some don't? If you look over in Proverbs chapter 20, Proverbs chapter 20, this is not just something we find in the New Testament. In Proverbs chapter 20, what do we read? In verse 12. And we can underscore this scripture here. The hearing ear and the seeing eye. This is not talking just about physically. The Lord hath made even both of them. So if I hear today, the Lord did. If I see today, the Lord did. And uh, so that's why even here is the Lord's faith. These same words. In fact, as you come back here to John chapter 7, he's addressing a mixed congregation on the one hand. So this is really one saying with two different directions, if you will, because it's like the gospel is a double-edged sword. When he says here in verse 33, yet a little while am I with you. Well, that applied to those that were seeking to kill him. It would only be for a little while. And then uh, you say, well, what was he speaking of? He's talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection and ascension. He came for that one purpose, so he would only be here for a little while. But that same word was also addressed unto those that were his disciples. Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Over in John chapter 14, this is what he was saying. In John 14, when he spoke of Peter denying him, they were troubled. Peter thought, no, far be it from you, Lord. But the Lord had already said to him, no, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me thrice, three times. Even there, the Lord's revealing unto Peter that were it not the Lord keeping Peter. What made the difference between Peter and Judas? It was the Lord. Both denied the Lord. But the Lord said to Peter that when Peter would deny him, that he would pray for him. And when he was converted, go and encourage the brethren. That's the only difference between Peter and Judas. Judas didn't have a ransom. In fact, Christ said, I've, I've chosen 12 of you, and one of you is the son of perdition. So their hearts were troubled, and should be. So should ours. When we consider and think about where it's up to us, we would do the same thing. But he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Here he was as a man before them, but not just any man. He's the God man. And when he says, in my father's house are many mansions, I don't know why the translators put that. It's really dwellings. That there is that place that God has purposed and ordained for each one that he's purposed to say. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. Now, when he says here in verse 2, this is the part I want to see, because it's the same thing that, He's saying over here in John chapter 7 that you'll seek me in a little while I'm with you, but you'll not find me because he said what? I go unto him that sent me. Here when the Lord says, I go to prepare a place for you, he's talking about going to the, to the cross. People think that he's up there right now building mansions, and as different people make their decision for Jesus, then he's got to find another place for somebody. That's not what he's talking about here. Here he says, I go to prepare a place for you. What is that place prepared? It's through his death. It's that reconciliation unto God for his people. And he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, going to the cross, I will come again. What's that speaking of? His resurrection and receive you unto myself. 
that where I am, there he may be also. They didn't understand all this, and the Lord had to teach them. As you can see, whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So yet a little while, I'm with you. He's talking there about being with them in person. But it would be just for a little while. Is what? He was going to go back to him that sent him. And when he went, and ultimately would die and rise again and send on high. When he says there in verse 34, you'll seek me and shall not find me. It, it's going back and forth. To, to the one he's speaking to comfort of his disciples, but to these others, thither ye cannot come, it's not up to man. Even as we saw already in our study in John chapter 6 and verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I'll raise him up the last day. Here they would seek him to continue to try to squelch and put down his influence and his teaching, his doctrine. Even after he raised from the grave, they started that rumor that the disciples had come and stolen his body. There's still people today still looking for the, the bones of, of Jesus. They'll never find him. Why? Because he's sent it on high. He's gone to the, the Father. But they marvel at this. And so will anybody that does not have the Spirit of God continue to marvel at what it is and why they cannot find him. I'll tell you this, again, if the Lord has been pleased to open our eyes to Christ, it's not that we have found him, but he has found us. And by his grace, he has already prepared that place in glory so that when our life is done in this earth, that same resurrection life that raised him from the grave is our hope. We shall see him as he is, and we shall be with him. Bless what we start. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 118. We'll stand and sing this, and then we dismiss. 118. When I survey the wondrous cross. Yeah. 
Dismissed. Look forward to next time. Love one.